Thank you very much, uh, Ching, and good morning to everyone. Let me first acknowledge uh, the president of PASCOM, Dr. Cherry Bernardo Lazaro, and of course the executive director, uh, Dr. Arcadio, and uh, Delen de la Paz, who gave the tribute to uh, Dr. Fernando Sanchez. Uh, well, I feel honored and humbled actually to be speaking to you today. And uh, I was a bit taken aback when Cherry said that uh, my scheduled talk today would actually be the third Fernando Sanchez uh, memorial lecture. But I think, you know, this opportunity actually gives a very good uh, time to connect the dots. I've attended uh, not all, but certainly the first and I think the fourth session of the PASCOM sessions, particularly the, the fourth one where Buching spoke. And really, in my mind, a lot of things have come together. And even the title of my talk, which goes and talks about the Southeast Asia, is, is almost co is really coincidental to all of this. And therefore, I'm very cognizant that I'm speaking to a young generation of, of social reformers in past. I guess the, the older generation, and that's composed of uh, Nandine Sanchez, of course, Buching, uh, the previous president, uh, Georgina Paredes, who, you know, I, I've never had the pleasure of actually encountering in deep conversation. And uh, the senior members of PASCOM, they're the old generation. But there's a new generation that has to step up. And I guess my talk is really focused on them, reflecting on the past as Buching and Dr. Arcadio have done, and even Delen has done, and you know, reflecting on the future. if you really ask me, perspectives of Southeast Asia. And really, this is because I was part of a half year uh, series of conferences by called Tuning Academy, which is really a, a European uh, entity that's based in Spain, in Bilbao. And what they do is actually they look at different curricula of higher education. And instead of being prescriptive, because I don't know if you've heard about the Bologna Convention. This is a Bologna Convention of national institutions that actually looks at making sure that there are good standards for higher education, but around the world. And therefore what they do is they convene regional conferences and we happened to be part of the regional conference, and that was over two years. We had six meetings in Asia. And we really looked at the terminal competencies of the medical graduate. Here, I call a primary physician. And therefore, my talk will, will focus on that. But before that, I'm going to talk about the evolution of the national and global strategies of primary healthcare and medical education. Okay, from my lens, uh, personally. And then I'm going to go and talk about this uh, curriculum that we invented, so to speak, in the Tuning Academy Southeast Asia project, which is uh, abbreviated here as TASE. That's Tuning Academy, Southeast Asia. And then finally, I guess I'm going to articulate a challenge to PASCOM, but actually it's a challenge to, to a group of entities, including APMC, the medical schools, many of whom are here, DOH, CHED, and PRC, going forward as the concerns of UHC implementation and health professional education converge. So let's go, and I'm going to go to part one. 
And essentially, I'm going to connect the historical dots from my own consciousness. But uh, you've heard already historical dots from Dr. Arcadio and Delen and even Buching. I'm going to try to deepen those dots with the purpose of passing on, you know, these this experiences to you, the younger uh, generation of PASCOM and the medical schools. This is a very nice picture of the APMC Board of Trustees. And you, you can see this was 2015. This was the year before Dr. Sanchez died. And you can see here to, to uh, his right or to the left of the, the picture, that's Dr. Arcadio. And then you have Debra in the middle. He was president then from Western Visayas. You have uh, Agnes here from UP and uh, Bert Rojas. And then behind are, you know, uh, myself, uh, Alfaretta Reyes. But I, I show this slide. Because I really wanted to highlight uh, Dr. Sanchez. And it's good that the LEN actually gave a detailed uh, biogra biography of Dr. Sanchez. But look at uh, the generation of Dr. Sanchez. Okay, He was born in 1935. That's actually the year of many of our mentors of that generation. Okay, One of the mentors I would uh, put in there would be one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Uh, Bengson who was Secretary of Health, okay? And then he graduated in 1959, okay? I was eight years old in 1959, okay? And therefore, you can see what I want to illustrate here, how the generations flow into each other, okay? And the next picture is even older. Look at that picture. Of course, this is UP-oriented, but every medical school should have a picture like this. This is a picture taken in 1930, 1955. And as you can see from the caption, it's the faculty of the basic science of UP College of Medicine during one visit of this guy, Carl Schmidt. Okay. But I have put in there key personalities. One on the top, do you know that, who that is? That's Dr. Jose Kuyugeng. This was 1955. And remember, I think what happened shortly after this was Dr. Kuyugeng eventually left UP and became one of the pillars in the establishment of UERM. This is uh, Dr. Florentino Herrera, who was then our dean when I was in medical school. Okay, he was in the basic sciences then. This is Solita Camara Besa, one of our professors in uh, medicine in biochem. But I put this here because it was Solita. This is a picture from the memoirs of Solita. Okay, and uh, in fact, uh, Solita was the aunt of the valedictorian of our class, Dr. George Camara, because uh, uh, she was the sister of George's brother, of, uh, of uh, George's father. And then this person over here in circle, that's my father, Conrado Dairit. And he was then with the Department of Pharmacology. But if you look at this picture, some of them, you know, uh, this is Dalmasio uh, Cruz, uh, the pathologist. This is Dr. Bagabaldo, the physiologist. You know, I won't dwell on this. Dr. Arcadio, who's probably in the audience, will, will relate to this picture very much. But this is to sort of draw the history of really the evolution of medical education and the thinking of medical education and primary health care as early as nine, the 1950s through to the 70s. Now, in my readings, and when I was reading uh, the memoirs of Solita, this is what I found. This is a quote attributed to Dr. Victor Valenzuela, who was, became the dean of the UP College of Public Health. And it was attributed to him and uh, Sekoye King. 
probably they were, this was in a discussion of the Extraordinary Curriculum Committee for Medical Education of UP College of Medicine in 1972. That was the year the King and I entered medical school as classmates. And look at what the quote says. The first and foremost need of the country is a national system for the delivery of healthcare in which the role of the community doctor should be defined as a member of a team through various types of paramedical personnel. You know, they were saying this already in 1970. They're already ahead of their time. Okay. And then part of that quotation is this. This community physician should show a strong desire to serve the poor and underserved rural and urban people with a missionary spirit to sacrifice personal comfort and advancement for the sake of service. That's from Wars, Up Close and Personal, which was published in 2004 by the UP Press. So what I'm saying here is that the seeds of King were already there long ago. But you see, they were conversing amongst themselves. They were not a critical mass of people who would listen to their ideas. In the 1970s, oh, we were dominated by the thinking of specialists and hospitals and going to the U.S. and all of that. And that was the environment in UP, even as UP was supposed to be the university that was producing scholars for the Filipino people. But that was just the reality. And so I go now to our dean, okay? Because Herrera essentially realized this. He realized the ambiguity and the ambivalence of UP as a university. But you see, when he became dean, as in our first year, Central Luzon had a big flood, and we organized the relief operation as freshmen. This is a picture, Tamusha. He's just wearing his lab coat because we were meeting in his office. We were organizing the relief operations. You know, Central Luzon was flooded for two months, and our classes were called off. When we get got back our uh, cadavers in our cadaver room, we had already grown molds. Okay, but also he also was dean at the time when I guess we as medical students, we came from different parts of, of the system, many from UP, but I came from Ateneo, Buching was from Ateneo, but he had come home from Yale. And therefore we were causing ferment in the medical school as students, you know, and, and that's why we already in freshmen went off and went to the rural areas for a community immersion. So that was our generation. And when we graduated, and this is a picture of us, you know, when we took our oath, this, I don't know where this was, this is probably PICC, okay? Uh, I was looking for Buching, pero wala si Buching yan. Hindi ko makita. Pero that's Lenny Hara over there, okay? That's Herrera, Dr. Herrera. I'm in that picture, but I'm here. I'm partly covered here, okay? And then many of these classmates, have either died or gone abroad, okay? But see, when we graduated, look at what we were saying. We, the class of 76, solemnly pledged to dedicate our lives to the service of the Filipino people. We shall try in the years to come to retain the ideals we held in the last four years. So you see, there was a lot of ferment already uh, in our class at the time. And if we were to continue that pledge, which we published in our yearbook, yes, in the choices we shall have to make, we shall consider social need together with personal gain. We shall try to bring whatever hu humanness we can to whatever situation we find ourselves. The health of the nation shall be our first consideration. We commit ourselves to the work of a healthcare delivery system which can provide adequate health for the majority of the people. 
We shall maintain the utmost respect for human life. We shall not use our medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity. We shall maintain by all means in our power the honor and the noble traditions of the medical profession. We shall strive to maintain excellence in our work, excellence adapted to the concrete conditions of our country. Note that concrete conditions that comes from a lot of our activist uh, language then. We shall give to our teachers the respect and gratitude which is their due. We in turn shall consider it our duty to teach those who come after us. We shall consider the health education of our people as our responsibility. We shall in turn strive to learn from our people's experience in health and in life so that we shall not become isolated from them. This plan we make as scholars of the Filipino people. So that was our pledge as the class of 1976. And so in a sense, think of it. We, are, we were descendants of the generation of Herrera, of Queen King, of, uh, of Sanchez, okay? And uh, just before us was really the generation of uh, Ramon Arcadio, who graduated about 10 years, you know, after uh, Nandine Sanchez. And so in studies on the DTTD program, Dr. Sudebarrios, this is what Leonardo said in 2012. Among the former Dr. Sudebarrios, the wish to serve the rural populations was the most widely cited motivation. Those who joined out of an interest in public health were significantly more satisfied with their rural work. Now that's looking at it really from a personal level. Okay, and uh, even as we went out, and you know, we were able to serve and we felt fulfilled. Really the goal is you know, to restructure the system. That's really the unfinished business. And we will go into that you know, in the later parts of this talk. But I just wanna show this, okay? These are pictures from our yearbook, uh, which we just published in our fourth year here. Oh, this is the Ching, okay? And look at what Sibuchingo, for 10 years, I was part of the Igorot people's struggle. He was in the Cordilleras, okay? And then he went back to UP and eventually taught, okay? And eventually became part of, you know, all of those critical milestones that led to the UHC law, okay? And of course, this is Bobby de La Paz. And this is a write-up of Buching and his wife and, and the, the wife of Bobby, Sylvia, you know, Bobby was shut down in northern Samar, in, in western Samar, no? in Katbalogan, in what, in 1982. Okay, so as this write-up says, he had dreams for the country, and for this, his life was cut short by bullets. Still, he lived a life heavier than a mountain, Bobby. So this was our tribute to them. But, you know, we had a lot of other classmates, and I, I'll just show you two more, you know. Uh, Lenny, okay. Lenny did her community pediatrics uh, residency, and essentially, Lenny actually spent her life organizing and, you know, uh, keeping alive, you know, the community-based health program, that network, okay? And th this is, of course, Al Paro, who went to Davao with us. And, of course, Al really went into industrial duty, you might say, on human rights, and in this case, you know, uh, trying to find, as she says here, transitional justice for the wrongs of martial law, okay? And so, you know, these were the likes of our generation who went out and, and you know, tried to reform, you might say, uh, what we could. And so this is me, okay? I went out, I actually stayed in Mindanao for 10 years. But for a solid four years, I was actually working in the villages. And this is a picture of me working. At this time, Ellery was, was also with me. And I was doing a number of things there. So I was teaching. I, I was working in the communities. And uh, I was also teaching in the Davao Medical School. And I was coordinating the Mindanao-wide community-based program. So it was really very, very 
I guess also developmental work. Um, I taught the first five batches of DMSF uh, graduates, some of whom also became social commercial catalysts in their own area. Okay, but and then who would know that uh, years years later uh, I would become Secretary of Health? Okay, but I put this picture really not to focus on the fact that I became Secretary of Health, but really to plant the seed that like people like us should eventually end up in that job. Because that's a position of power. You can really do reform. And the reform can only come in, you might say, in, in, in measured doses. <laughs> reform the whole system at one go. And therefore, you have to have a succession of really good secretaries of health to get the reform going, the momentum being built up, okay? Um, then Dream Sanchez was a reformer, but he was in the Akdim. You have to link up the reformers in the Akdim with the people who are in DOH, with the people in the private sector, because all of these things have to come together. It won't work if it doesn't all come together. And so let's go now to the, to the international level, global. Okay. Alma Ata declaration was in 1978. That was our first year out of medicine. We did our internship in 77. So it was like, you know, after we, uh, we went out and we were working in the communities, boom, Alma Ata, that actually validated all of our beliefs. Okay. And this is Haftan Mahler. He was old now, time, okay. But essentially, those whole principles, and well, you know what Bukhin was saying, those three strands, in Chinese uh, barefoot doctors, liberation theology in, uh, in Latin America, and eventually CBHPs. You CBHPs, we were drawing from what we were learning from China and also from Latin America. You know, I was organizing in Mindanao. The church was very strong there. And it was a time of martial law. And if you were not part of government, and you were not part of the church in Mindanao at the time, you were part of the underground, okay? And so, in a sense, you know, we were all sort of connected one way or the other. But in my case, I had a very, very legal personality. And we were organizing above ground, working really in the villages and actually trying to see if it worked, you know? And we were learning that you don't hear up, you know, especially when you're working with very poor people. Because, you know, the theory there was that you were organizing anyway, the people to surround the countryside and then take political power. That was really what we were trying to do. And so we were talking political empowerment. We were talking, you know, uh, conscientization of the people. That was really the language then. And community medicine very nicely into this because community medicine was really organizing among the people okay, and empowering them. And so fast forward now, and this is now 2003, okay? Uh, I was then Secretary of Health. I went to Geneva and at the time uh, in 2003, there was a resolution in the World Health Assembly that said we have to focus on human resources for health as a global issue. And uh, at that time, it was J.W. Lee already who was uh, the director general, okay? After uh, Mahler came uh, Nakajima for 10 years, and Nakajima was a very conservative uh, DG, not a reformist. He was succeeded by Brundtland, who now tried to, you know, reform things. It was under Brundtland that they passed the tobacco treaty, okay? And then after Brundtland, who only served for one term, C.J.W. Lina. And so this is a quote from J.W. Lee. 
We need to ensure access to a motivated, skilled, and supported health workers by every person in every village, everywhere. That's not just Philippines, huh? that's everywhere, Asia, Africa, because the global crisis in human resources had become quite evident. And that was put on the global agenda in 2004 with the resolution. And in 2006, this came up. Actually, I was, I was the person that helped organize this when I was already director of the Department of Human Resources for Health because that came under my watch. Okay. And uh, we worked with uh, a lot of experts globally and also with the WHO Secretariat and came out with this document. It's available in the website. You can look at it. But it actually then dissects the issues of the health. And then JW Lee died in 2006 and Margaret Chan took over. So Margaret Chan, eto na, this is when China was then trying to assert its influence on WHO. And Margaret Chan was a perfect candidate, you know, she was Chinese, but she had a Canadian citizenship. She worked in Hong Kong as a, uh, the director of uh, health operations there. And it was during the time of Margaret Chan that this document was produced in 2008. And in 2008, that was the 30 year anniversary of PHC and they created this, really this wonderful document that pieced together how UHC came together, but this time using a health systems and people oriented lens. Because during the time of Mahler, we didn't know how to operationalize PHC. We, people didn't know, how do you operationalize people empowerment? You know, people's participation. How do you then reform the medical schools? So at the time, uh, it took 30 years, you know, to sort of sort that out. This document came out in 2008, and this is Margaret Chan, you know, just repeating the primary health care mantra. I believe we will not be able to reach the health-related MDGs unless we turn to the values, principles, and approaches of primary health care. Those principles and approaches, that's enshrined in the PASCOM six pillars that you actually had. Okay, if I want to, to connect that dot. And I will show that slide again. And so in 2010, and this was probably the culmination of my time there in uh, Geneva, we were able to pass the WHO code for the, uh, for the code of practice on international recruitment. And essentially what the code just said was said was top countries don't poach on the health workers of poor countries. That's essentially what this code says. And, you know, you have to support the development of health workers in poor countries. You know, the Philippines was sort of in the middle of this, you know, but the, the, the Philippines didn't support this, you know, officially, because at the time, 2004, ang policy ng Philippines talaga was, ano eh, send the health workers abroad. Our economy that was producing, you know, our system, our education system that was producing a lot of workers, Department of Labor not in, export. That was really the, you know, the, in a sense, the ambiguity. I was sort of, uh, you know, pushing this, but really the, the Philippine delegation, and, you know, we were friends, okay, officially, they did not uh, participate in any of the debates that eventually came out of this. They were just quiet and listening. And so this was passed by the World Health Assembly. And so that, that's part, of, that's, that's the only second treaty. Uh, this, this is only the second uh, resolution, which is soft law, as they say. It's not a treaty like the Tobacco Code, which is a treaty. This is more like uh, soft law, okay? Uh, you might say an instrument that persuades rather than directs. And so with that in place, the other things that were happening in, Gene in, in the, uh, the global area at the time was, see, 2010, okay, we passed the code in May of 2010. In December of 2010, the Lancet Commission came out with this. You know, the persons that were behind the Lancet Commission 
were also the same people we were talking to in Geneva regarding human resources for health and how to move the global agenda forward. And so these are people like uh, Julio Frank and Lincoln Chen. I was, you know, I was actually invited to be part of this commission as a personal note, but I couldn't because my political nun yung ano, yung WHO at saka yung mga ibang global players. So because I, I was a WHO employee, I, I, I kept my distance. But, you know, I was at the launching of this report at Harvard, you know, in 2010, because who knew Frank was already then the dean of the Harvard Medical School. But as you can see, it's the same mantra, a slow burning crisis emerging, mismatch of professional competencies to patient and population priorities because of fragmentary, outdated and static curricula producing ill-equipped graduates from underfinanced institutions. Okay. Go back to the what Victor Valenzuela and Kui Keng said in the 1970s, you know, it's just the same idea. And so this comes out, okay, looking at the educational system and the health system systemically. How are you going to reform? How are you going to bring in transformative learning and interdependence in education so that education is not siloed? And so they talk about the reform being, you know, dealing with structure. So here, Alamo, in many places, their educational systems different from ours. In the UK, for example, tax-based. And people that enter medical school there are funded by the state. Our system is public-private. Okay, so a lot of private institutions create you know, the graduates really based on the vision of that private institution. And therefore, that comment about academic freedom for institutions. But you need to design institutions appropriately. That's what it's saying. Okay. But you also have to design your instructions appropriately. And here, you can see here, criteria for admission, competencies, Channels, career pathways are so important to start to reform your system. And this is really what we have to put our minds to. It's a system. And the system, it's not a mechanical system. It's a complex adaptive system that actually changes, morphs with changes and feedback. Okay? And actually, ironically, can be set back by things. Like, for example, local government code, high-flown principles of empowerment at the local government level, and see how that has created chaos, you know, in your healthcare delivery system with a very, very noble goal. So really thinking these things through, and, you know, you can't predict it. And so if I were to just quote from this, because it's very beautiful, the text, okay? And you have to lean close to your screen, but I'm going to read from it, okay? Transformative learning is the proposed outcome of instructional reforms. Interdependence in education should result from institutional reforms. On the basis of these core notions, the commission offers a series of specific recommendations to improve systems performance. One, instructional reform should adapt competency-driven approaches to instructional design. Adapt these competencies to rapidly changing local conditions, drawing on global resources. Promote interprofessional and transprofessional education that breaks down professional silos while enhancing collaborative and non-hierarchical relationships in effective teams. Exploit the power of information technology for learning. Strengthen educational resources with special emphasis on faculty development. And promote a new professionalism that uses competencies as objectives criteria for classification of health professionals. And that develops a common set of values around social accountability. <laughs> Institutional reform should establish in every country joint education and health planning mechanisms that take into account crucial dimensions such as social origin, age distribution, gender 
composition of the health workforce, expand academic centers to academic systems, encompassing networks of hospitals and primary care units, linked together through global networks, alliances, and consortia, and nurture a culture of critical inquiry. Ah. That's a mouthful. But that gives us an idea of really what needs to happen if we were to reform the health and the educational system. And as I said, you know, reform is generational. Okay, so the next generation has to take this to heart. So at the same time that that was going on in 2010, another group naman was working on the social accountability principles. Ito naman yung grupo ni Bolin at saka ni Willard. Okay? But if you look at this, they, they try to put on paper also a global consensus. Now, you see, see Bolin had worked with WHO. Okay? And he was one of the direct, uh, he was one of the coordinators in the, in, in the then department for, you know, sort of manpower development. That, that was the name at the time. And when he left the WHO, he pursued this agenda, this vision, to try to bring social accountability to the medical schools. And, and so if you look at the directions, anticipating society's needs, partnering with health systems, you know, the language is there. Adapting evolving roles of doctors, because you know, the, the roles of doctors have not really evolved from the 20th century, and I'll explain that more. Fostering outcome-based education. Ako, I use that synonymously with competency-based. Think of it as the terminal competencies. Creating responsive governance in medical schools. So, you know, the deans are so important here. And the trustees. Refining scope of standards. Supporting continuous quality improvement. Mechanisms for accreditation because you want some, you know, way of quality control. And then, of course, bringing in global principles and defining the role of society in, you might say, even the development of that medical school. So you can see here an integration between the health sector, education sector, the society, even the global community. This is really what it's all about when you're thinking about connecting these dots. And therefore, we go to our local situation, CHED Memo 2016. Okay. No, that was six years after the commission, after all of those global developments, putting HRH on the table. Okay. And when you think of it, these are sort of uh, profile outcomes, but they're not really, you know, find uh, deeper. Okay. Uh, but the words are all there. Okay. And you can see there the strands of the reformer, lead and manage, interpersonal team, systems-based. The words are there. Accountability. And question really is, you know, how are we putting this into practice? That's really, you know, what kind of physician are we developing? Or are we, is this just lip, lip service? That's really the question we have to ask ourselves. And so, Ah, the PhD pillars and the PASCOM course, uh, you know, uh, pillars, uh, outcomes. Look, the words are all there as well. The right to health, social determinants. This was a report that came out in 2008. It was a companion piece to that WHO primary health care report. Primary health care approach, again, recalling Alma Ata. Community participation, which is one of the principles of Almata. And then health systems. That's a later concept, you know, in 2000, when they now started looking at uh, health in terms of systems. And then, of course, here, primary care, okay, as one component of primary health care, because the primary care level was one of the weakest in the whole health system. So there, it's the question of, you know, making it come together. Now, a little bit more, and this is Buching's slide, uh, just to re-emphasize it, okay? How this is now embedded in the UHC law, 
So we've made progress. It's now in the law, which has to be implemented. Okay, so we're, we're in a good place in terms of the documentation. And then, here, uh, going back to Buching's lecture last week, how to produce a healthcare practitioner. Okay, so there was a question there, how we're going to change the CHED memo, you know, change the words, okay, and move into these words. But the thing is, we have to be sure what's underneath those words. And so with that, I'll move now. And, you know, this is just one example now, Puchinke, Hari Hamoy, that, you know, many doctors don't think like this. That aside from, you know, treating patients, that you're thinking about, you know, how your patients are going to find access to care. You know, that's a very different skill. And so my takeaway from part one the seeds of system-based thinking in medical education were emerging in the 1970s, as shown by the quotation of Victor Venezuela Kuyikeng in the work of Herrera. It was Herrera, I'm missaying this, it was Herrera that actually set up the UP Institute of Health Sciences, which was renamed to School of Health Sciences, because of this ambiguity and uh, ambivalence that he felt. That many UP graduates were all going to be, you know, many, a large proportion, at least 50%. And during the 60s, 60, 70, 80% of UP graduates were going to the States. And then he was, that's why he set up UP Tacloban. Okay. And he had partners to do that. Okay. So they were planting seeds. Okay. And as Mona Arcadio said, UP School of Health Sciences is now growing is now in Baler and in Coronadal, okay? But, so the challenge of medical education today is to build on the science-based, problem-based approaches of the 20th century towards the system-based approaches needed in the first 21st century. Because really, we are all trained as doctors to be science-based and problem-based when you think about the evolution of medical education. But what, you know, the social reformers are saying is that you have to build on that and be systems-based. So are our doctors thinking that way? Or are the majority still 20th century? Because you can be stuck in the 20th century. There, there's a lot to do with science-based and problem-based. There's a lot to do. So I'll move down to part two. And here, I'm just going to try to talk about the, you know, what happened in this PASE project, okay? Because it gives you an idea also of what was the thinking in other countries in Southeast Asia. But you see, so these are slides that we made for that. Learning and working together for a better medical education, the ASEAN. no, no. You know, okay, so what's really, what's better medical education in the ASEAN? So what are the medical educators in the ASEAN? Now, this is our group, okay, just to give you an idea of who we were, okay? But uh, as I said, there were three representatives from the Philippines, myself, and then uh, Western Visayas State. This is Lynn Al Alcala who is one of the, she's a medical educator there. And then it's, you know, it's Remy. She's University of San, San Agustin, okay. How we were selected, you know, I don't know. My contacts ng Bilbao. Pero look at the other members, okay. There were members from Malaysia. There were members, marame from, uh, just follow my cursor, from Cambodia, Myanmar, Indonesia, Vietnam. Okay, and then we had consultants from Netherlands, it was Anna. We had a consultant from France, and then we had a consultant from Italy. They were actually just there listening. The dynamics were really ourselves. And our goal was to come up with sort of a template for the medical graduate. Okay, and remember, you know, we, we had the first meeting, we didn't know each other, and then you said, okay, create what might be a template 
for a medical curriculum and what should that grad graduate be? You know, we didn't we didn't have a chance to go into deep conversation about medical education reform. I think that was my regret. You know, we didn't have that time for that. Eh? But uh, when you look at it, and it's reflective of the thinking. Okay, so about us, we were very different. Different educational policies, different quality assurance mechanisms. The curricula were different. You know, iba yung Pilipinas, iba yung Malaysia, iba yung Vietnam. Okay, so we had to somehow come together and agree on competencies, okay, and come out with what, you know, would be a doctor, a physician, a primary health care physician, okay? And so there's a few tuning methodology, sorry, for this, okay, which was, as I said, already developed. And so tuning applied it, and this is how that their methodology works, okay? Essentially, you look at learning outcomes and competencies. You start from there, and then you look at your curricula. In our case, we looked at existing curricula because you could actually develop a whole new curricula based on the competencies that you have. And then from there, you you determine your teaching and learning approaches. You know, this is not far from what Sila the Web are teaching in, uh, you know, in medical education. And then select types of assessment and evaluate. So in, in, in tuning, in our six meetings, then we were able to go up to somehow here. We, we couldn't go the full cycle, okay? And uh, we were asked to actually look at the competencies based on our own curricula. And this is what I'm going to tell you about, okay? So we define the competencies. We look at the, the degree program. So for example, the competencies that we had, you now say, are these embedded in the existing curricula of your medical school? And we all had to go through that exercise. And then also ask about how you're implementing it. So this is the iterative process of the tuning. But the whole idea is you have to have a student-centered curriculum where you consult, you profile, you know, competencies, you design your curriculum, you evaluate it, you enhance it, and so on and so forth. So really, this is the type of cycle that medical schools in the country can do now. You can consult, you can profile your, the competencies, you look at the, the curriculum that your schools have established. What have they been designed for? What are, the, what are the competencies that your graduates are producing? And how do you actually evaluate that they have those competencies? So with that, again, another way of looking at it, we develop what we call the meta profile. This is sort of the super profile for Southeast Asia. And I'm going to go through that in the next few slides, okay? What were the competencies that we came up with? Now, the thing is, when we had this conference, we worked together with not only medical educators or physicians, we were also with engineering and teacher training. So they asked us, what are the generic competencies for all of your disciplines? And this is what they were. Ability to work collaboratively, okay, and in, in, in different contexts. That's a generic competency for medicine, engineering, and teacher training. And I'll just go down the line. There are 14 or 13 of this. Ability to use information and communication technology purposefully and responsibly. Ability to uphold professional, moral, and ethical standards. Ability to demonstrate responsibility and accountability towards society and environment. We talk about that a lot. Ability to communicate clearly and effectively. Ability to think critically, reflectively, and innovatively. Ability to understand value and respect diversity and multiculturalism. Ability to carry out lifelong learning and continuous professional development. Demonstrate problem-solving abilities. Ability to initiate, plan, organize, implement, and evaluate course of action. Ability to conduct research. Ability to demonstrate leadership attributes. Ability to apply knowledge into practice. And that's... So just reflect on that, okay? Uh, we all contributed to that. We had to discuss it. We had to fine tune it. 
And remember, this were this were sixty or what eighty people trying to do this in a day, okay, to come up with these generic uh, competencies. And then we went out into groups, and then the medical people then came out with specific competencies, and this is what they are. I'm trying to move. Okay, there. Ability to practice according to various clinical standards. I can't, I can't see all of the things. Eh? Ability to appropriately perform is certain. Pakikigit ng yun dito yung pagkadoktor talaga ng grupo. Ability to perform physical education uh, examination. Yung mga clinical lumabas dito. Integrate clinical workup to make diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Appropriate therapy and psychosocial approach. Explain benefit and risk in therapeutic options. Very, very clinical, ano? Ability to perform consultation with patients and family, and family with empathy. Ability to manage medical records. To ensure and maintain patient safety. Promote health. Dito na yung lumalalim. Health and preventive medicine. Address public concerns and controversial issues related to health. Ability to demonstrate a balanced dedication to serve interests of individual patient and commitment to social justice and the common good. An ability to recognize and estimate health risks and health care needs of a defined population, particularly of vulnerable groups. If you think of that, it's not too profound. This is a very 20th century terms of reference that looks at science-based education and problem-based education. It's not a reformer's uh, terms of reference. Okay? And if, we, uh, if I had to go back to that tuning discussion, I would have wanted to have this discussion with the Malaysians, the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, and Laos, and the Myanmar. Pero... At the time, ano eh, par parang we didn't have the bonding to go that deeply. Eh, kasi iba yung mga ano eh, political systems nila. Eh. And like, for example, the people in Myanmar, in Dibao, with all of the suppression going there now, you know, medical educators don't think as reformers there. They're just trying to follow what the military says. Or, or you know. So this is what we came up with. And then what we did, was then we created a diagram for that, which is the, which is this, Yan and Meta Profile. And if you look at it, the Meta Profile has the competencies around these four areas, knowledge and skills, communication, ethics and professionalization, and quality assurance. This is the term that they wanted to use. Okay. But these competencies surround, you might say, the goal for all of them, which is the patient and the family, community, and population care. So if you just look at the specific 11, you, the ones that are more population as well as individual-based, promote the health and preventive medicine, which is there. Recognize and address public concerns and con controversial issues related to health. Recognize and estimate health risks, costs, define population, particularly of vulnerable groups. Demonstrate a balanced dedication to serve the interests of the individual patient and the community commitment to social justice and the common good. Actually, you know, these are not cast in stone. And PASCOM can create a profile a meta profile of all Philippine medical schools and see what you come out with. But you can see at the middle of that, particularly for that Southeast Asia group, ensure patient safety. Very, very patient oriented, the middle. Okay. And then you can see, you know, I won't go through all of it, but it gives you an idea that these are the general domains of the competencies. But the knowledge and skills observation is really very clinical, very science-based. You're, you're not talking, you're teasing out the domain of leadership, of social reform, of social catalysis, which is really 
what changing the system is all about. And so when you look at this, we even looked at, uh, no, we did statistics, okay? We looked at the importance of the competencies and whether they were being achieved. And this was done. And we did surveys of students. And this is what they said, okay? Very high importance of the generic competencies, high achievement in the upper levels. But look at here. Oh. The, the students don't think that they were getting this as much. You know, the leadership part, the communication part, all of these mas mababa in their, in their estimation. If you're thinking about trying to draw a correlation between what is important and what is being achieved. I'll show you two more examples. This is generic competency system from the point of view of employers. But you know, employers, mga hospital directors, people that employ doctors in corporations. Look at this. Same. Mataas dito, but the employers don't think that it's being achieved. They all think they're important, but they don't think they're being achieved as well. Okay, and then look at this. Generic competence sees by the graduates. Okay, and this is the one that's highlighted here. Leadership attributes and conduct research, mahina, from the point of view of the graduates. So they're saying, and this is Southeast Asia, that they're saying, you know, weak in, in, in those competencies. And finally, subject specific competencies by employees, again, very high in the specific competencies here for the clinical. When you go down now to the other specific competencies with regards relationships with patients, you know, preventive medicine, biosocial approach, you know, the employers are ranking the graduates slow, including even with, uh, with uh, you know, the leadership. So that tells us, and this shows you that the graduates and even their employers see these competencies that we were able to identify as very important, but the level of achievement, not as much, which tells you, you know, you ask yourself then, we train our graduates. How do we really measure the achievement in those areas that we're trying to train them for? But also, as we say that, we know that these things evolve over time. You know, your leadership skills evolve over time. You're not going to manifest that immediately after graduation. But how do you then try to measure it, you know, in these different... Uh... And so from degree profiles to meta profiles, generic specific competencies, looking at the degree profile, this is essentially what was the tuning methodology. And then there were some people that applied it in their curriculum. So it was Indonesia. They apply the tuning methodology to improve their curriculum also here in Malaysia. So I guess this is the message of this portion, that the tuning methodology, looking at competencies, can be applied here in the Philippines and looking at our medical curriculum. And so we produce this final publication, which I asked uh, Cherry to send you. And uh, if you read it, but if you haven't, you can go through it. And therefore, that the tuning methodology can be a useful tool because it's essentially a method to look at your competencies. And so with that, my takeaway observation for part two, competencies of the Southeast Asian Meta Profile describe the 20th century physician as expert in health professional. It does not highlight the role of social catalysts to transform the health system. That's really my main observation. But the tuning technology can be used to move transformative education by defining new competencies, new learning approaches, and new metrics. You know, we're, we're thinking in the back, exposure, community, immersion. But uh, that's not the only way. And therefore, being creative in learning. Like in our case, if I go to our personal experience in our class, it was not just the community immersion. We were actually talking to faculty members. We were organizing dinners with them, as picking their brains about, you know, what uh, 
what needed to be changed in medical education. You know, and sabi pa nga nung isang professor namin eh, uh, tignan ninyo pag uh, nag-graduate na kayo kung saan kayo pupunta. <laughs> Kami na yung sinabi. Kasi parang he was saying, well, you'll all probably also end up a specialist, you know, when you actually uh, make your decisions. And actually, that was, in a sense, what we were all about. When we graduated, we could have gone another track. Okay, but we said, okay, this is the track that we will go to because this is the track that we feel, you know, is needed at this time. And that's where we ended up. With that, we go to part three. And this is the shortest part because it's a challenge to, to all of us. Okay. And I go to this because it's really, I just want to highlight this. Looking at the curricula, the structure, and really... Engaging CHED, you know, CHED as a regulatory agency, it's basically reactive. You know, there, there are no visionaries there. They're essentially just saying, okay, this is the basic, okay? And as long as the medical schools fulfill the basic, good enough. We'll accredit, we'll, we'll uh, give you a license. So even within government, you have to have visionaries. And therefore, you have to have people to step up in this positions of leadership if you're going to make any structural changes. And so this is just another way of saying that if the goal is transformative interdependent education, this is what we have to do. Mobilize leadership, enhance investments, align accreditation, strengthen global learning. And we have to get people who think this way. So in a sense, uh, who was it that just said it? Uh, was it Leah or was it Dr. Arcadio? It's one thing creating a community-oriented or medical school. It's nothing, another thing ensuring that your, your graduates actually go out and practice that community orientation. But it's a slow process because not everybody buys into the ideas anyway. Because you can just so, be so busy during the sciences, science-based part of your uh, specialization. So the challenge to PASCOM catalyze the development of curriculum, learning activities, metrics for transformative medical education in the country, and establish the PhD pillars within the fabric of medical education in this country. So uh, this is my last slide summary. So while system-based change to transform medical education was articulated in the Lancet Commission, seeds of this idea were being planted in the Philippines in the 1970s. However, the 20th century approach to medical education, which is science-based and problem-based, are well maintained despite its inability to address the shortcomings of the health system. That's what we're all saying. This seems the case not only in the Philippines, but in other countries. Our challenge is to build on the achievements of the 20th century and transform medical education in the first 21st century where systemic thinking, dynamic leadership, and social reform should change in effective ways to truly realize better health outcomes for all. Thank you very much.